first request and I don't catch something, oh, you didn't take U.S. history. Oh, man, what, what do we do now? Um, so we, we go through multiple checks to make sure they're on track for graduation and on track for meeting those requirements. Now, when we start having these, you know, all these outside credits and cold stream and, and stuff that we don't always have straight in here that get added here separately, it gets a little more complicated, so make sure that you're communicating with me regarding any online coursework and that kind of thing. Um, this year, if you are doing online coursework, we are going to start asking for progress reports um, throughout the year. So we will be checking up and requiring a printout of some sort or your kid to come in and log in and show us where they're at. Tip, I think we're going to probably plan on doing it every other progress report that the school gives out. So essentially halfway through the semester, at the semester, halfway through the second, and at the end of the year we'll need the grades. Just to make sure we had issues where students ended up like bailing on the class and didn't tell anybody about it and got super behind and we had to just, you know, push them through to make sure that they actually finished and graduated on time. Um, so we want to try to avoid some of that. Are there, yeah? Just to let you guys know that from the teacher's point of view, if your kid gets an A minus, you don't need to get too worried about that. It's still 4.0 yeah. on the scale. So calling us to raise that to an A because you're worried about what that's going to look like on the transcript still shows up as a four. It's not a huge. That's, that's B good. plus that's good. doesn't mean that you're going to get a higher mark in your B. It's still a three point grade. That's a good point that was brought up this morning. That I'm glad you brought up because that well, that is a question that a lot of people have. Is what is a is that like a quarter point addition to the GPA? No. So. But the A minus and, and plus That's for you. Is, is really for, for teachers and for you guys to say, hey, you're close to a B slash you're, you're, you're doing really well. That's really what the A minus, A plus, and standard A is for. Um, they don't get any extra bonus points for, for getting an A minus or an A plus. Um, it's just a, denot a denotion for people's information. Um, any questions about transcripts at all? We won't go over how to order transcripts yet, because you guys will probably forget, we'll do that next year. Um, but just know there is an official process for ordering transcripts when you start sending them to colleges, um, scholarships, sports, that kind of thing. Okay, but we'll cover that next year. I know. I, I give Rachel a really hard job sometimes when I talk so fast. Yeah. I'm doing better today. I'm slowing down. No, you're not. You're not. Yeah. Credit summary is just high school graduation, not the Correct. A through G. It's not A through G. I wish we I, I It's one of my goals at some point if we could put that on there so that people can see where they're at in terms of meeting that A through G requirements. The nice thing is our high school graduation very much mirrors the A through G requirements. The biggest difference is going to be your foreign language and art requirements, um, where that's the big difference, where you need two years of the same foreign language and one year of an art instead of one or the other for one year only for graduation. And the other big denotion is the grade that you need to be eligible. So for graduation, you can get by with a D minus. For college, you can only get by with a C minus. So that's sometimes where people get messed up, is they'll pass English here with a D, but then you know they'll need to, if they want to go to college, they need to go back and retake that D to get a C or better. Um, so that's kind of where it gets a little confusing and separates. But it does mirror very closely. For English is the same. Math is fairly similar, um, so yeah, but that is only high school when it's showing up. Okay. So just two years of the same language? Yeah, minimum. And one year of art? Yes, minimum. Um, one note too, before I get a bunch of emails uh, and phone call messages, when you're on there, many times it'll say uh, graduation status. It might say five credits required of English 11, for example. Um, many times, I, if I'm remembering correctly from looking at it with the student, when you're looking at it, it'll say what's enrolled and then what's you're only enrolled in first semester right now, according to the computer. So if you see five credits of like English 11 or U.S. history, and you're like, I'm enrolled in there. What's going on? That's why. So don't freak out about five. If you start seeing 10 credits of English 9 or, or 10 credits of English 10, that's when we need to talk because you're in 11th grade you should have that class done by now. And a 10 credit is a full year. Anything that you're probably enrolled in currently is going to show up with five as enrolled, five as needed. Just so you're looking at that, you don't have like this heart attack. Um, so some options for the fall of, not next year, but the year following. Um, and we'll kind of go through a little bit of each of these, but uh, primarily when I'm doing college nights, the big ones that I really spend a lot of time on are the four-year college, primarily because those are the ones that take the most preparation. And there's so much information to know. We do, do spend a lot of time, at each, or plenty of time at each of them on two-year colleges, trade schools. However, the process for starting that down that road is relatively straightforward and pseudo-simple. 
Um, it's much simpler in terms of the application process than going into those four-year schools. Um, when we talk about four-year colleges, we're talking about essentially, uh, you know, four major systems that we're looking at. The University of California, the UC system, um, with the eight schools, I believe, right now, and then the 20-something, I'm forgetting now, um, 20-something CSU or California State Universities across the state, uh, all the private schools throughout California and around the country and even the world. Um, there's many private schools outside of the country that students consider going to. And the out-of-state public institutions. Okay, so University of Colorado, University of Utah. Um, those are all the systems that most students are going to, many students are going to consider pursuing at the four-year level. We also have the community college system or junior college. They're used interchangeably. Um, the 112, I believe, that are in California. And most of the time, students are going to pursue, if they're looking at junior college, they're going to pursue a school within the state of California if you're a California resident. If you pursue an out-of-state community college, it's about the same price as going to an in-state four-year college. So it's not going to be any cheaper going out-of-state uh, for a junior college. So if you're looking at like TMCC, stuff like that, sometimes they have like a little system where they can like give you a good neighbor and a little bit of a discount. Um, if, since we live so close, sometimes they don't though. But if you're looking at like, I'm going to go to a junior college in New York or something like that, you just know you're going to pay big bucks to go to a junior college um, out of state. So that's where the savings is going to be. And most people that go to these two-year community colleges are going to be probably also be going close to home usually. Um, most people, and it's not the only option you have. Plenty of people go to Santa Barbara, they go to LA area because they want to, you know, change the scenery many <coughs> times. However, just know that when you when you kind of leave the local area, you lose some of the benefits of going to the community college, which is sometimes a cost savings. Um, the tuition is going to be cheaper, but really where you're going to be saving a lot of money is going to be room and board, because many times people that go to community college are going to live at home, at least for a year usually. Um, so that's a big money saver if you're thinking, you know, living in Santa Barbara or LA, it might be 800 bucks a month in rent. Um, for a room, and so you know it's like that's eight nine thousand dollars a year that you could be saving uh, if you lived at home and went to say Sierra College or South Lake Community College. Um, the other thing is there's there's kind of a, a a misnomer going around that community college is not a good system. Um, community college is actually a very great system. Uh, it's designed for both students that are graduating high school, but also people that are returning from work or maybe they have you know, the, not don't have the ability to support themselves possibly going to a four-year college full-time they have to work while they're going or they have a family so they can only go part-time to community college um, however the college itself is a very high quality uh, school system and they have people transfer every year from two-year colleges into four-year colleges and sometimes people think well what is what you know who's, is it a bad thing like that I go from Sierra College to Sacramento State you know, are, are they going to say like, uh, well, you graduated from Sacramento State, but you started at a community college? No. So, so when you graduate and go through this transfer pathway, if you want to pursue a bachelor's degree, um, and not everybody does, and that's fine. Um, but if you wanted to, it's not going to say, <coughs> congratulations, here's your diploma, bachelor, you know, bachelor of arts from Sacramento State. Oh, but he started at community college underneath. No, it doesn't say that. It just says you graduated with your bachelor's of arts. Um, from Sacramento State or Stanford. I mean, you, people transfer to Stanford. It's 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 you, anything's possible. Um, however, uh, that's not the only pathway, and there there are guaranteed pathways or loosely guaranteed. They call it a guarantee. It's not a, really a true guarantee anymore. Um, but as long as you're meeting progress and their requirements, they actually have what's called an associate's degree for transfer at the community college level, which is a program of study for students who are planning on transferring into a four-year program. Um, that really comes with, if you do all this right, you'll, you'll get into these places. Um, so, so there's definitely some research if you're looking at possibly going down that route, uh, but it is a way to possibly save money. It's not always the cheapest option, especially if you're lower income. Sometimes it's more affordable to go to a four-year college rather than go to a two-year college because of some of the financial aid. And sometimes one of the biggest downsides about community college is if you don't have a plan. The biggest thing about that is... is if you're not planned out and you don't have a set kind of study option system or system of study, uh, it can take you three or four years to get through what's considered a two-year transfer pathway. Okay, so that's just something that can take a lot of time, and you're still paying tuition and not completing your degree. Um, 
There are also trade schools, which are going to be things like, you know, like Universal Technical Institute, Wyotech, Culinary Institute of America, play, uh, schools and, and organizations that prepare you for a certain type of skill slash certification that you can go out right after usually like maybe a 12 to 18 month degree, you know, certification process and get a job. And, and really these are kind of like the um, up and coming um, opportunities. People are graduating from University Techn Technical Institute after 18 months. And, and you know, they can be pricey, but they're starting making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year sometimes right out right out the right out the gate as a you know diesel mechanic or something like that. So they're 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 not a not something that's less of an education. Education at any level is important. So I just want to make sure we cover that. Um, there's also the straight to work uh, idea of you know you're able to go straight to work and many times some people will say, Well I'm gonna go work for a year and then go to school. I would caution people about taking a year off to work. The, the statistics around that are people find it really hard to leave a well-paying or a decently paying job to go and get uh, schooling plus the motivation factor and many times you find a boyfriend or you have a kid or whatever it might be and things come up that you know, life deals with um, you in a certain fashion and you end up sometimes not returning to school even though you wanted to or that was your initial intention. And then finally, we, we have kind of like the idea of the military we have, which is a great uh, opportunity for, for some students. Um, Peace Corps, which is kind of like a, a volunteer organization. Uh, a gap year, uh, and some people have some questions about what a gap year is, or if there's specific programs that um, really promote gap years. So the gap year is an, as a whole is an idea where students take a year off, or possibly more, but typically it's about a year, to pursue some sort of volunteer opportunity. Um, that's kind of the best use of the time. Some students will use it to travel and party and have fun, um, which is not a horrible use of time. But it's it's not it's you're not usually serve, you, serving your your future very well by just you know backpacking Europe after high school. Um, it's a great opportunity, but most of the time when people do gap years, they're going with Rotary to Southern, you know South America and volunteering or working in a you know um, an impoverished school volunteering with a. Uh, a boys and girls club or something like that. So that's what many times other people will also ski. So they'll do is they'll pursue sports to like the fullest of their ability without having being tied down by sport uh, by schooling, um, possibly in a gap year as well. Uh, and then study abroad kind of falls underneath that same category. Most of the time, study abroad is going to happen when you go to school. Okay. Any questions about kind of the the overview, broad, general look at kind of what's going to happen hopefully after high school at, at one of these levels? All right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the four-year college and what to expect when we kind of get to that point where we do need to apply to schools. Um, and some people get scared because they think I'm only that number that's on that piece of paper and those grades that are on that piece of paper. And you kind of you are, but that's only one part of you. Okay, like I said, schools are not always only concerned with that GPA and class rank, but it is an important piece. And why I say that is because right now. Um, if you look at this, I want you guys to try to describe this tree. So just bear with me as we go through a little exercise. It's so like, what's, what's going on with this tree right here? Like, where is it at? How big is it? Has it got struck by lightning? You know, is there bugs or maybe a, a bird family living in it? You don't know. Because you only, you only see essentially this part. I can tell you it's not, uh, you know, what are, what are those trees that we got? The big white ones. This aspen. aspen tree, yeah. It's not an aspen tree. I can tell you that, um, but that's about it. I'm not, you know, I'm not a botanist, so I couldn't tell you exactly what what all this stuff is. However, um, this is what people think about when they think of college admissions. They think of this picture. They think this is what schools are going to see about my kid. They're going to see my kid in this little box, and they're going to see this little itty bitty portion of them. However, this is really what they're going to see. So a lot of the college admissions and with the exception mainly to the CSU, the California State System, this is kind of the model that most schools are using now. Kind of the, they call it the holistic or comprehensive review process. Okay, and this really looks at all those different as attributes about a student, from uh, their grades to their family situation. Did you have, uh, you know, some trouble in your in your family, or you know, did someone go through cancer while you were in high school? Did you did you get sick while you were in high school? That's impacting your grades. Uh, what kind of extracurriculars were you act, were you involved in? All this kind of thing is what schools are really paying attention to now. And obviously some are going to have a little bit better, higher weighting than others. Um, but they do consider all of these things. Um, 
I don't have the slide up here, but, but the UCs actually coined the term comprehensive review. Um, when you start looking at private schools, uh, you know, the UCs have what's called a personal statement included in their application, which is about a thousand words, two questions that you have to answer. Um, however, many of the private schools, when you start looking at kind of, you know, the East Coast schools, smaller liberal arts schools, they're going to have one or more essays that you actually have to write, and it's very specific questions you have to answer. And so that's another piece of the puzzle that colleges look at. So, you know, if your kid or you, you know, if you think back to your high school, sometimes people didn't do so well, look where you're at right now. If your son or daughter doesn't have the best GPA right now, one, it can always get better, and two, um, it doesn't always, that's not always the biggest factor. Sometimes other factors are more important to schools, and uh, there's other ways to also compensate for maybe a deficiency in one area can be compensated in another way. Um, so I don't want like you guys to get, get discouraged based on a few small factors, or, or you know, smooth, they're not so small sometimes, but a few factors that maybe show up on a transcript or that you know you think are like these big red marks on your transcript, where you know they're they're kind of a big deal, but it's not a deal breaker. Okay, so that's that's really what I want to kind of go over about like college applications. Next year we'll get in more specifics about what that actually looks like, um, but let's talk. Right now we're kind of more in that actually getting down to brass tacks and like figuring out what we're going to be doing and how do we make this list of schools before we actually get into that application which will which will be for fall of next year um, so so where do I apply and how do I build out this list okay there's a lot of different schools of thought out there about college applications and the number of schools that people apply to um, this is kind of the ones that I subscribe to, but it's not the only one available, so if you're not happy with it, come talk to me, we can find a different one. Um, but I find it, it kind of gives us a broad range and a broad number of schools that we look at. And again, this is primarily talking for your colleges. When you're looking at two-year colleges, you don't need to have seven or eight typically community college um, community colleges in your list. Usually, you'll, you'll probably have one. You'll probably have your closest one or one what you, where you want to, want to end up. Um, because you're not going to be applying, you're not going to get turned down, so you don't need to have multiple options for that, unless you want different places you want to look at living. Um, but you really are going to only apply to one or enroll in one community college. For the four-year colleges, though, they actually can deny you, and they do statistically deny you more t more times than admit you. Um, so that's why you need to have a broad range, and both broad in terms of the number and broad in terms of the difficulty of getting in. Uh, so the, the, the kind of terms that we use are reach, target, and safety, okay? And, and I, I suggest between six and 10, seven and 10 colleges in an application season is, is usually a, a decent amount of, uh, of schools to apply to. Anything above 10, uh, you're, you're kind of starting to spend a lot of extra time that you don't necessarily need to be spending, um, and money typically, because these applications are typically not free. They're usually anywhere between 50 and 100 bucks. Um, per school, so you're going to apply to 10 schools, that's going to be 500 to 1,000 bucks right there. Um, so it gets pricey pretty quick, and that's not including sending things like uh, SAT scores and transcripts and all this other stuff that also comes along with it. So it can be pricey. Uh, but 6 to 10-ish um, also gives us a good number because you're going to want to reach schools, meaning how competitive are you? And competitiveness can be judged a couple different ways, meaning um, you can look at, like, uh, through your Naviance account, you hear me mention Naviance a couple times, your students should all have been on Naviance. Um, maybe not Emily, but um, we're working on getting some of those guys up and going pretty quickly. Um, however, uh, you can look at things like average GPA for that school. You can look at things like average SAT scores. And again, it's average. So again, if you're not in that kind of average, there's still a chance for you because average means right in the middle, not, you know, there's people with above and people with below. Okay, so people do get in with less than that GPA, people do get in with more, um, and people with more do get denied. So, so it's, it's, it's really kind of you're taking it with a grain of salt. However, it's really important to just consider it and be realistic with it as well. Um, one thing I would highly, highly suggest avoiding is having five to six reach schools, and those are the only schools that you end up applying to. Because, and, and you know, one way to actually look at that is, um, you can also find through Naviance and other resources, and I just e literally emailed out today another link um, for a really great tool that the Department of Education at the national level just released on Saturday. Um, and it's a, it's a really great comprehensive review for a lot of different 
um, schools that are out there, and it's backed up from like the national government standpoint. So it's not like some company gathering in their schools are paying them a bunch of money to, to post really good stuff about their schools. Uh, it's a pretty user friendly. I've poked around a little bit only, but it's so far I like it a lot. One thing that you can look up though is the admit rate or admissions rate of that school. That's another great way to determine competitiveness. Um, so you can almost you can almost like break it into thirds right here. So you can say, okay, two reach schools. If you're like a, a higher level student, that's gonna probably you don't want any schools, you know, you don't want a ton of schools with twenty percent admissions rate or less. Okay. That's saying, you know, if you start doing 25, one out of four, or three out of four students get denied for every student that gets admitted. And most of those students, when you start looking at like Harvard and MIT and Stanford, those really highly selected schools, we're starting to look at four or five, six percent admissions rate. And all those students that are applying to those schools, they're not, you know, the 1.5 GPA students. They're all 4.0 students, 4.5 students with all great SAT scores, wonderful essays. Um, wonderful parents, you know, everybody is rooting for them, and still, four to six percent of those students still get admitted. Okay, so if you have your entire list built up of those schools, this, you're actually betting your statistics against you that you're not going to get in anywhere. Um, you'd have to be fairly lucky to get into, you know, your list was made up of all kind of IVs or all really high, highly competitive schools. So that's why we also want to break down of all these different levels of competitiveness. So you're not kind of stuck up a creek come March or you know, April and you have to make another decision and kind of settle for less. Um, those target schools are going to be kind of like if you're looking at your GPA range and kind of that average that you can look at slash the competitiveness and admissions rate, that's going to be more towards kind of right where you fit in. It might be a little challenging maybe for you to get in but not like extreme. Um, and it's not an extreme possibility that you'll get in. So that's going to be somewhere in between, you know, 25 to maybe 50 percent admissions rates, kind of in that safety realm, or the, the kind of like good fit realm. When you start looking at the safety schools, there are going to be schools that you're, you're, you're probably at or above that average rate. Um, well, you're, you're pretty likely on your kind of capabilities and your scores and your GPA and, and whatever else you have going on to get in. And it also helps to have schools in that area that are also um, in the pretty non- selective category, um, or if you want one definite safe school for us, that's going to be Sacramento State. Um, Sacramento State's a great school, but it's also our local school, so if you meet the CSU A through G requirements and typically have a 3.0 or better, and don't like totally bomb the SATs, you're almost guaranteed admissions. Again, I use almost because nothing is really a guarantee in the college admissions world, but you I haven't seen a student denied yet that's met that, and that, that also comes from the CSU system as well, that, that we have local kind of privilege, I guess. Um, the problem is people are like, well, I'm just going to add that school because I know I can get in. Okay, That is one of the worst things your kid could do, because it's going to be, uh, what's that, the guy's law that Murphy's everybody, if anything goes wrong, that can, Murphy's law is going to happen, and you are... That's the only school that your kid's going to get into, and they're going to have to either go there or figure something else out. Okay, so if that's the case, like you don't want to put a school on here, and that's why the research piece is key and starting that process now, because you want all schools to be quote unquote top choice schools. Naturally, there's going to be a hierarchy of which one you prefer to go into or which one sounds the best to you, but you have to be your student needs to be happy attending any one if that's the only one that they get admitted to. Likelihood is they'll have multiple to choose from. Most students, if they kind of follow a good plan and build a decent applicant application list, they'll have a couple decisions to make come the spring of their senior year. You don't want to be the one that doesn't that has one decision to make and it's not the decision that you were really wanting to do and you kind of just put it on there to have an extra application to meet, make Mr. Reem and your parents happy. Um, so I want to warn you about that. And again, no school safety is kind of a misnomer as well. No school is safe. Every school is competitive. Um, you can get to get in, at any four-year level. You can get denied anywhere. Um, so there's no promise. Even if your grandpa built a building, um, you can still get denied no matter where you end up. Okay. Um, I forget what the next slide is. Let me see. No, let's see if there's any questions. All right. So any questions about this slide at all? Um, the application list. I think. Do you have a question? Or did I answer it or forget? Okay. Um, so yeah, this is something that they can start doing. I did show, did I go in and show juniors yet? I can't remember. Um, 
I don't think I have yet. Uh, but they can go into their Naviance account and start creating a list within there. Um, there's two options when adding schools to kind of their lists. They can add schools which they're applying to, which they won't do until they're seniors. Um, and there's also a list, to st you can create a list of colleges I'm thinking about. When you start searching on Naviance with, with the colleges I'm thinking about, there's actually a button right next to each college that you can just click on. What's helpful for that for me is because when I meet with students, I can actually pull up that list every time before. I do, I, you might not know this, but I do research and I look up stuff about your kid every time I meet with them, if I have a meeting, before you guys come in, if we have an appointment, to find out, what's, you know, find out what their grades are, to find out you know, if they've added colleges to the list, what's their career interest inventory look like. So I'm ready for that meeting and I can bring some insight and knowledge to you guys. However, um, it really helps me if they add colleges that they're thinking about looking at to this list on their Naviance account because I can then pull that up and target and tailor what we're talking about regarding colleges um, more specific to your son or daughter. Um, so, so I will show them, um, I'm going to be meeting with uh, probably every other month I'll be meeting individually with each Pathways class at each grade level so I'll be going around and doing lessons with each of them. Um, so like for example this week and next week I'll be doing 10th grade Naviance lessons. I think after that I'll be probably be doing junior lessons fairly quickly. Um, so we'll be going over some of this stuff with your kids, but just so you know, if, if, if you're having them do one to two, that's a great opportunity. They come home, my homework's done, Mom. Guess what? Hop on Naviance, do a college search, start researching some schools, and we'll talk about what things to look for. Um, so how do we start? So the big things that I look for when we actually start looking at college applications and starting, create, starting to create this list is um, it's always nice to start with the must-haves and the must-have-nots. Okay. And there's two must-haves and two must-have-nots. One would be the student's must-haves and must-have-nots. And it might be very broad, it might be very specific. But just, you know, you have to start somewhere, so just starting with whatever they can get on that piece of paper. For both my school must-have X, Y, and Z, and my school must-not-have if there's any X, Y, and Z. Okay? There's also a parent must-have and must-have-not. And I suggest also thinking smartly about what you put on this must-have and must-have-nots. Um, that might be things like the school must not have co-ed dorms, or the school must not have um, crime rate above this, or be more than 5,000 miles from home. Um, those could be all must-have-nots, or must-have, uh, you know, a great uh, graduation rate, or this program. So, so there, those are the things to start with. Because if you guys come in and set up an appointment with me, which I do highly encourage you guys to do at some point this year, sit down and start talking about this. Um, but if you guys come in and set that appointment up and you know say, well, we want to talk about college, that's kind of like me kind of just like throwing something out there and picking out of the 5,000 colleges that are out there. So really, it's got to start with you guys. You know, I'm going to ask you guys, okay, what's important to you? What, what you know, is location important to you? Do you want to live on the East Coast? Do you want to live on the West Coast? Do you want to live only in L.A.? Like, there are some specific questions you guys can ask and you guys can think about as a family, as a student can ask, that's going to help guide our search. And what's nice is I can do that as well as, I mean, Naviance has the capabilities many times to really narrow down some of those things and you can pull up a list, it'll spit out a list in five seconds for you as well. Um, so those are all things that you can start thinking about from location, okay? Uh, do, you, do you like the winter? Do you want to live at the beach? A lot of kids up here want to go move to the beach, that's our most popular location. Um, so San Diego, Cal Poly, Long Beach, those are all very popular schools for our kids. Um, how big of a school do you want? Your student will probably be fairly culture shocked if they go to a school with 20,000 to 30,000 students from our school with 370. Um, it's kind of a big change. Sometimes they think they'll like it. Many times it's kind of a bit, little bit weird for them at first. Um, but sometimes if they're, they're, kind of, they're, they're seeking that piece out, it's a good fit. But you want to consider that part of and that question uh, when you're looking at what schools to look at because you can definitely find schools of all different sizes. You can find schools as big as our high school um, if that's what you're looking for. If they play sports uh, at different levels, so you know there's the different levels of the NCAA, of the Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. They have intramural sports, which is kind of the unofficial uh, sports that students can join that you don't have to be recruited for, for example. Um, so are those important to your student? Is that something that you need to find um, and must have the ski team or whatever it might be? Okay. Um, level of prestige, and I'll just say something about prestige. Um, prestige is not everything that people think it is. Um, this day and age, almost all schools out there are going to give you a very high quality education. You're going to get a very great job no matter what degree you end up with. 
um, and what the name on that degree is. Okay, the big thing that many employers are looking for now is did one did you finish college? And unless you're going into a very technical field, um, they're not so much concerned about even sometimes what major you even took in college. Most people you might look in here. How many of you guys are taking working in a major place uh, in a a job where you studied in school for that major? Many times it's not that many. Many times people get a job, you know, they graduated with a math degree and they're working in sales. Um, so, so it's not always about where you graduated, what program you go through. The times that it is, it can be important. Is sometimes when you're even less so when you start looking at some of like the technical fields. You start looking at engineering, architecture. Some of those fields can be a little bit. Uh, it can be a little bit more important about the strength of their program because many times some of those um, organizations will recruit from certain schools. Um, you know, Apple will recruit from Cal Poly or this engineering firm, HP will go recruit from Cal Poly, whatever it might be. They might have some relationships that they've developed and they like the products that that school is creating. Um, so that's a slight advantage to certain types of schools. Um, the biggest one that you'll see is if you're considering things like law school, medical school, or anything that's going to like, or, or you know, post-study schools of any type, um, you know, vet school, that kind of thing, is going to be fairly important kind of where you go to school. Um, not so much even, it's, it's important in your undergrad program, but definitely important in your graduate degree program, because you know, you go to law school, you're going to graduate Harvard and Yale, and these big time firms are probably going to pick you up. Um, it's going to be a little bit harder to get noticed by some of these bigger, for, you know, bigger firms, for example, if you go somewhere else. Um, so that's where prestige really kind of jumps in. However, there are plenty of schools that are not necessarily on the radar all the time, and they're, they're wonderful schools. Did you know that the one, one of the biggest reasons why schools have this level of prestige and why everybody thinks they're great schools, it's not because they're school. It's because they're sports teams. It's because they're football team. It's because they're basketball team. And you're, most of your guys' students, 99.9% .9 of students, are not going to go to college and play on the Division I football team, basketball team, cheerleading team. Um, it, the odds are just against them. And so, but we, we kind of value schools based on how their football team is doing that year, how much money their marketing budget is for their uniforms, um, whatever it might be. That's how we view and, and kind of develop this prestige. And many times we assume that they're, you know, because they have this great football team, Berkeley also has this awesome, you know, academics program, whereas, you know, Sacramento State maybe doesn't. Um, and they both actually do have really great, awesome academic programs. Um, it's just sometimes they get more out into the, the universe because of other, in, other factors. Um, another thing that uh, is important to consider is financial requirements. So what is your family's finances? That's something you start thinking about now. It's not something you want to have to figure out after you've been admitted and, my, and your son and daughter is like, I'm going to Sacramento State, yay! And, and you're like, oh man, how am I going to pay for that? That's not a good time to figure out that that's not an option for them. Um, and it's a very real conversation that you should include your son or daughter in. Um, it's not always black and white uh, because financial aid changes every single year and uh, it's not always the simplest process to find a, a straight answer regarding how much a school is actually going to cost you. Um, however, there are some tools out there called like cost of attendance calculators as well as net price calculators that are typically on... Um, you can find them on many of these websites. I don't think Navance has the capability of doing the cost calculators. They can tell you how much financial aid, how much like tuition is, room and board is, but uh, it won't spit out like how much aid you might be getting from the FAFSA. But each individual uh, school website, I can't think of one that I've never seen one on there. It just might be buried a little bit, but if you just Google the name of the school and cost of attendance calculator or net price calculator, usually the first couple links will lead you where you need to go. Um, but that will typically gather some information about you um, and your tax information. Usually, It's usually fairly basic stuff that you can look up from your return. And it'll spit out an estimate about how much you, it might cost your family in particular in that particular year uh, to pay. Just keep in mind, when you're looking at those numbers, they're for one year. Okay? You're, you're basically building a four to five year investment. Okay? So if you see $25,000 a year, that's how much you can pay. You might think, oh, that's not so bad. I can do that. Grandpa's got that in the bank for me. And you, you, you don't really realize that, that you've got to do that every year for four years. And many times, your financial aid actually decreases over years. Um, you usually get a better financial aid package in the freshman and sophomore year. And sometimes it can decrease as they get older. Um, students sometimes start working, which then factors in. And many times, they kind of front load some of the, the financial aid package. So that's always a question to also ask if you guys are looking at a financial aid package eventually. 
and it's not quite what you thought, or it's like more generous than you expected, calling up the financial aid department at that school and asking, so are these scholarships something that, or these like scholarships that we got, merit scholarships, or these grants that we received, are they something that's renewable every year that we'll be eligible for as long as we meet these income requirements? Or is this a one-time only grant or a one-time only scholarship? Because they might give you a $10,000 scholarship, which makes the difference, um, but don't tell you that that's only a one-year scholarship and then you're going to be on the hook for the other three or four years that you're there. Um, so that's an important thing about finances. And then setting up, you know, looking at your finances, doing those cost things, and figuring out, okay, how much are we going to be as family, as parents or grandparents or uncles and whoever else, how much are we going to be contributing towards your education? Okay, you can say, you know what, you have however much the government gives you based on our tax information, you can estimate that as well, but however much that is, and then we are going to help out with $10,000 a year for four years. And that's how much mom and dad are giving you. You can choose to pursue a school that's going to cost you $20,000 in loans every single year, but you need to realize that that's how much you're going to be taking on, and we're not going to, we're not going to take out a plus loan for you, we're not going to, you know, you need to be pretty, pretty strict, or else they might build up a list of schools with all their tuitions, $80,000 a year, and it's not something that you're going to be pitching in for, and you don't want your kid to leave, you know, bachelor degree with a $150,000 in debt. So, so not only having that broad range of competitiveness and admissions kind of criteria, but also the finance is important too. You don't want to have a bunch of really expensive schools as the only options that your student can attend. Um, so, so that's just something to consider. Uh, obviously, you don't have to figure that out this second, but it's just something when you're looking at the list and creating the list that finances will be a major factor in people's decision. Um, it's unfortunate that we kind of do college shopping backwards. Uh, we don't go to the car lot and pick out our favorite car, test drive it, and you know, get all the paperwork done, about ready to sign on the dotted line, pay our deposit, and start the financing, and then determine how much actually cost the car is going to cost. Um, that would be a pretty silly way to shop for a car. However, that's how we shop for colleges. Um, so it's a little bit weird and it's a little bit different because you're not going to find out your financial aid package until usually April to March, even later sometimes. And your decision day for submitting college applications and, de and deposits is May 1st. So you really have about a month and a half from when you find out kind of your financial aid package of, okay, how much is this really going to cost me to now brass tacks are coming down and we need to make a check out to this school that we're going to go to. You've got about a month and a half to make that decision. That's actually probably the most stressful part of the college application season, okay? Mainly for parents, but many times for kids too, because they have the decision between two or three schools many times, and they've got to make the decision about where do I want to actually end up. Okay, so that's all coming down the pipe. Just so you guys know, it's not something you have to worry about this year, but when you're looking at the process, just know that that's a big consideration that you have to think about. Something that you also would want on your halves is for your own kids' safety is what kind of housing is there. That's a huge problem that I've talked to a lot of returning freshmen from college that come back and say it's, you know, housing, whether it's comfortable for the kids or whether it's affordable or is it an apartment, is it a dorm, and, you know, and then how do you get there? Do they allow cars if you're a freshman? These are questions that you should ask the school because if you're planning to send that kid in, in a car and they don't allow it, that changes how they get home. So, I know it sounds stupid, but when Christmas comes around, you might want to have your kid around, you know, to find out how they get there. Travel is important. I mean, it, the other thing that you don't fact, like, when you're, when you're looking at financial aid, they're factoring in the average student. So, if you're sending your kid across the country or to Hawaii, um, it, you're going to want to probably have them fly home a couple times a year. They can home at summer, you might want to home at Christmas. It starts adding an extra three, five, six, seven thousand dollars a year to that cost that's not included in financial aid. So, so it's fairly important. Um, yeah, so I mean, good point about the housing as well, because you know, places like Cal Poly, for example, you might, people are getting tripled up. When I was there, and even quadrupled up in times, when I was there in the dorm room that I lived in, that was like barely big enough for two people, they're trying to shove four people in there and call it a tuition discount, or a room and board discount, when it's really just they don't have space and they can't justify charging you, five, you know, that much money a year without being sued. Um, but it's pretty, it would be pretty uncomfortable 
being shoved into the room that I lived in with one other person with four other people. Especially, if I actually liked my roommate and brought him there from college or from high school. If you just met them for the first time and you don't like them, or they stink, or whatever it is, like, that's going to be a bad start to your freshman year. Um, so, so that's something. Uh, um, and then creating a tracking progress. So you have that Naviance list where you can create the, the online options. However, um, I always suggest as well developing either a pencil and paper method, whether it's a, a, a little a binder that you can create with little tabs that you can put into it if you're kind of the old-fashioned way, or what many students are doing now is using a Google Drive. They have Everyone's got that Chromebook, everyone's got the Google account. Um, creating a Google Drive folder for college applications, and then as you're researching, pull some of this important data, because you're going to want to be able to compare and contrast these things kind of next to each other at some point. Um, you're going to want to have all the key pieces of data across the board from admissions rate to um, graduation rate uh, and be able to easily accessible and track it. Because they'll spend some time, I'll, I'll do research with them, and they'll go, oh yeah, I like this school, I like this school. And then, you know, they won't write anything down or save anything. And the students will come back later and basically have to start over again. Every time they're starting over. And so they don't really ever make any progress. So really starting with them and, and showing them at home too when they're doing this with you guys, hopefully, uh, developing that tracking progress of where they're at. What did you call that Google? Google Docs or Google Drive. Um, so it's basically like a, 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 like a word processing uh, spreadsheet tool that's for free online. Um, and all students at the school have access to it. Um, so Peter probably has, he's got an account and I'm sure he knows how to use it, but yeah, just have him, look, have him create that. And it's basically he can create his own folders just like on his computer that he can use it online. Um, where am I at? Let's see. I think we're good there. Any questions on this? Can I, can I mention something? Else? Yeah. On the, on the student loans, some of these student loans are not, uh, you can't covered by bankruptcy. Correct. You're, Most student you're, loans, actually. You're raw. Yeah. I mean, really so yeah, you get you get in deep, you get $150,000 in bachelor student loans, loans, and you you get out of school and you make $40,000 a year, it's going to take you forever to pay them back, and even if you even if you lose your job, you're not going to be forgiven by bankruptcy. Um, so it's a fairly big deal to take out loans, and, and I, on the other side, I don't want you to be afraid of loans. Loans are what make college possible for most people. I would say almost all people end up with loans of some sort, unless you have a ton of money socked away, um, or you're, super, you're pretty low income and you're going to qualify for a lot of government aid. So uh, don't be afraid of loans. It's really loaning with, with responsibility. Uh, what is a reasonable amount, reasonable amount of loans? And it could be dependent on what program you're going into. If you're going to be going into an engineering or architecture for, you know, program, you're going to graduate in four or five years, and you'll probably get a job that's going to, you know, start you at sixty, seventy thousand dollars at times. You could probably afford to take a few more loans out uh, because you're probably going to start the higher salary. However, you're going to go into like maybe a history major, you might not, or a philosophy major or something like that. You're probably not going to start out making big bucks. So, so taking out more loans might be more risky for that student. Um, and there's also different types of loans to take out there, you know, and we'll, in your senior year we'll actually go into like more of the specifics about the different loans, but I mean there's subsidized where the government actually pays your, your, your interest as you're in school, so you don't, it doesn't actually accumulate anymore. There's unsubsidized, which basically from day one it's accumulating interest. Um, there's plus loans, which are actually loans that you guys take out as parents and basically give to your kids. I would highly caution you about those because that becomes beer money. Um, and, you know, it, there's a lot of different things out there uh, from merit aid, scholarships, grants, which is free money. You always want free money. Uh, so any grant you guys get, always accept it. Um, most of it comes from the state or government or federal government in terms of grants. But there's also things like merit scholarship, merit aid, which would be like, you did a good job. Here's some money for you. Any scholarship doesn't have to give back as well. Um, but always, 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 whether it's in the application uh, for admissions, financial aid application, always read the fine print. This is not uh, iTunes where you can just scan through and you know not read it and hit the I agree button. And you know, I'm always afraid they're going to add in there like you owe us your car or your firstborn child is ours. Um, but no one reads those things. This this is not the time when you want to skip not reading those things um, because there are some pretty impacting kind of language in some of those agreements that you're signing up for, like payment repayment of loans and. Um, what can disperse loans, you know, death or, or you know, d divorce or whatever it might be. There's fairly important things that students will be signing up. If you, in, the, in the hurry of kind of getting signed up and all the other stuff going on, many times people will just sign it and move on. 
but it doesn't go away. Like cork can't make it go away. There's a lot of different things. The other thing I was going to say, a lot of like the uh, state university, the students can't finish in four years. Yeah, so I was actually, you read my mind. Um, I was actually going to talk a little bit about, just briefly, um, about, oh man, it's already 6 o'clock. Oh, 6 15. Okay, I'm going quick. I'm going to go much quicker now. Um, but that's a good point that I don't want to, um, like, I want to make sure that we talk about because that makes a big difference. Um, graduation rate is a fairly important thing to consider when you're looking at colleges. Um, for example, I'll just kind of give you an example of kind of the impact it could have. So the difference between a five-year graduation and a four-year graduation um, can probably be close to about $100,000 in both cost and tuition and then missed, lost wages. And that's something that a lot of people don't consider. They think of the tuition. They think, oh, it's going to cost me an extra year, so maybe an extra $25,000. They don't consider is if you graduate one year earlier, most people are going to start making forty or fifty thousand dollars in that first year. That's an extra year that you're not working and not moving up the pay scale and not getting that experience. So that's also a factor to consider. So you're losing money, but you're not also not making money. So so looking at that that graduation rate is a fairly important number to look at. Um, you'll see it typically spit out in either four-year graduation rate or six-year graduation rates. Try to find the four-year if you can. The six-year is kind of a cop out. Um, everybody should graduate in six years. Um, it doesn't take that long to finish school. Most of the time you'll see kind of students, the four-year degree becoming kind of a five-year degree is what's kind of the most common place right now. Um, some schools uh, in the past and kind of off and on actually make you sign a form that says you will graduate in four years and that's typically schools that either want to use it as marketing or they're overcrowded and they can't. They want you to take your classes and not dilly dally and get out of there. Um, so there are some of those schools, but uh, definitely looking into that number is a pretty important thing and should be a big factor when you're looking at colleges. Um, let me keep going because oh, did I do that? Let's see. I oh, we're gonna skip this. Is that an appointment with me at some point? Uh, not. I would say maybe November and beyond. Right now, I'm kind of having to focus on seniors um, and getting them through this process, <laughs> and then you guys are next. Um, so essentially, uh, I do want to spend maybe the last 10 minutes I got with you uh, talking about testing, and I hope I can get through everything as completely as I hoped um, in that amount of time. But two big things about testing that are going to be happening, and this is a big year for tests, and this is primarily the college entrance tests. The, the SAT and the ACT are the two big real ones. This PSAT is something that uh, we will actually be testing all juniors and sophomores in for free. Um, so a little bit different than last year, uh, if you had a junior go through before. We actually talked our district into paying for it, so that's a really good thing. Um, take it here at school? Yes, yeah, so school it's take, it'll be taken here at school on October 14th. It's in the morning, and it's usually about a half-day test. Um, so it'll usually be done right about lunchtime. Uh, we don't start have students come in late, so just if you want to add it to your calendar, that's a date that you want to have your kid here on time. Um, it is a Wednesday, so they might be used to coming to RTI and not or not coming to RTI. Um, I will not let them in if they show up late. I model it just like an SAT. If they're late, they don't come in. And guess what? You guys didn't pay any money this time, but you wouldn't get your money back either. Um, same thing with the SAT. If you're late, tough. Doors locked. So, so it's good practice. Um, hopefully, they're all here on time. But it's free for everybody in the 10th and 11th grade. Um, the junior year is also fairly important too if your student is a very, 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 very strong test taker, um, like 99th, 100th percentile type, um, because that's when this is the year when they get entered in the National Merit Scholarship uh, contest, and that's it's a it's a big deal. Um, for example, like Tara and Ingrid last year were were kind of, were, I mean, were semi finalists, which is a big deal, but it, there's like no money or anything tied with that. It's when you start getting into the finalists and award winners, that's when it kind of becomes a big deal, like get you in a Harvard type thing. Um, but it, it's when you get entered. So if you have a very strong test taker, that's when they get entered in that exam and that contest. And it, it's basically, you know, there's nothing special they have to do, they just have to take the PSAT. Um, another reason why this is big is not only because you're going to start taking these tests this year, um, but because the biggest test that we'll have you take, the SAT, is actually changing, and you're the first set of kids to go through it. Um, so fairly exciting, but fairly scary at the same time. Um, so the SAT is being redesigned. The PSAT will be on the new redesigned test, so that's going to be our first ever look at what it might look like. Um, this so year. This year. So October 14th, it'll be the new test system. 
Um, it'll be the new format. Uh, and then the, the actual first SAT that's going to be on this new redesigned format is going to be the March administration. Um, I don't have the exact date for that, but it's usually mid March. And it is offered at the Squaw Valley Academy. Uh -huh. I found out that they already have one, and that's early, but it's easier than. I don't know where the other two times are, but I called Squaw Valley Academy to ask them which. They're usually all at the same time. Which of the spring, uh, spring of, which of the spring dates they would be hosting, and it's oh, March one. Okay, that's good. Just FYI. I think they're doing. Yeah, they have a list yeah. online too. I think it's October. The October third one. If your student takes the October third, I believe there's one in November as well, um, which is based on the old methodology. Does that count? Yeah, so so here's my, so from the information, there, just so you guys know, this is like, the College Board did not do a great job prepping people for this, either at the high school level or the college level, both the people that they serve. <laughs> um, and so both high school and college people working at that level are still scrambling to figure out how to handle this, what they're doing with it. Colleges are actually still deciding, they have not even published many of them, what they're going to require, um, how they're going to deal with getting results from two different tests and compare them, um, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of information coming out. So from what I, what I know, and what I, the research that I've been told and the research I've done, um, both, school, both tests will be accepted um, for this year. Uh, my kind of, from the research and talking to other colleagues around college admissions and then also in school counseling, kind of my approach and my suggested kind of testing setup that I would suggest this year. In most years, every other year than this, I would suggest starting probably taking your SAT in January. Um, that's usually when students are, have about enough information under the belt, they're about ready, they've taken the PSAT for example, they've gotten their scores back in all likelihood, and they, they kind of have some data going into the first test. Because this, this year, they're really changing it in March. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me on that same kind of idea for them to take one on the old system in January and then jump right into another one um, in March. That's totally different. Uh, for, for, the, for one reason, their first SAT is never their best. It's usually their worst. Um, they're, they're just getting used to it. Um, the other reason is uh, I also suggest taking the ACT at least once. And then you can compare and contrast your results. Students will score better on one or the other in, all, in most likelihood. It's very rare that they kind of have a dead heat. Um, the ACT tests a little bit different, differently. It also has a science component to it. So if a student has a strong science, strong science background, they might score better or feel more comfortable on it. And then if that's the case, you can just ditch the SAT and focus on the ACT. They're pretty broadly accepted interchangeably. Um, However, with the new one, if you, my suggested route would be taking the ACT in January or February, that kind of time window, and then starting with the March. You can take March, May, June, August, or October, November, and December up to six times on the new SAT before you really are kind of done a, uh, having to stop being able to take that SAT test. So you have six opportunities. And most of the time I suggest about three to five it's kind of that magic window when students get over that hump of being new and nervous and kind of having that really crappy first time and then plateauing on the other end with, you know, kind of four, five, six number, they start hitting this maximum where they can, they stop performing, uh, getting, getting much better. They kind of fluctuate around the same kind of uh, percentile scores that they're going to get. Jeff, do they all stay on your record or you can take the highest or they right. kind of look the at it as the background? Last. So, so don't worry about all their scores because they all the colleges get all of their scores no matter what. So they get them all. Yep. And then what if what if you have a 300 on one and a 780 on another? So so there's a couple different things, a couple different ways that that colleges look at scores. Um, there the two main ways are your single sitting score. So they're going to look at your your highest you know they're going to add up and look at your highest single sitting. So single date. So that might be your March date or your June date or whatever it is, and they'll look at that number. The other way they do it is they actually do what's called super scoring, which means they're not looking at the dates, they're looking at the different subjects. And they're gonna, su they're gonna take your highest math, your highest English, and, and combine them all together for a super score, even if they're on different dates. Um, which can help and hurt students because your, your student may have a, a higher single sitting score than someone else, but when you super score, then that student might then jump ahead of you, or your, your son or daughter. Um, 
because they, they score better in different areas. But most do super scoring. No, most do not do super scoring. Okay. So one, they do one city. Typically, yes. But there's no waiting. I mean, if they're looking at six and you take your, your best city and you have five crappy ones, do they look at those in the periphery? They consider them, but not, highly, not really. Um, my, my kind of answer to that is colleges don't have time to disqualify students. They only have time to qualify students. Uh, and that's really the kind of the approach that most schools will take. They, they don't want to work kids out of a spot. They want to work kids in. And they're curious what you can do. They don't, you know, obviously there's a story that comes along if you're pulling off really low scores and all of a sudden you jump up, they're going to kind of wonder, like, what happened here. They might make a call to college boards, like, this kid cheat. Like, um, but, but, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're going to take your highest score as, as what, what you're capable of, and they're going to use that and take that as a benefit of doubt, I would say, most of the time. There might be an odd college out there that might kind of, like, look at that kind of wonky, but... Um, but the UC systems in Cal State... They don't have... They don't have time to do that, and typically what colleges even do is they don't even, they get an electronic score report from the college board usually, and the computer system actually crunches it all down. The, the, no one ever even typically sees the other stuff. They're going to take whatever they want, whatever they're looking for, pull it out of the report, and add it to your profile system automatically. So no one typically can even see that sometimes, and, and really they don't have time to. They're, I mean, I didn't put it in this, but in the senior one, 68,000 people applied to Berkeley last year. Like, they don't have time to read 68,000 score reports, um, plus personal statements, plus applications. Like, they, they use automated systems. How much does it cost to take each SAT? I think it's like 50 bucks 50. now. 50, 50. So 300 for six. Yeah. So yeah, your high school has an investment involved. <laughs> Oh, um, do, well, they, they just pay for the PSAT, I thought. We don't, nope, not this year. PSAT is free. No, no, but what, I mean is, what I mean is the school, the SATs are also paid by the school? No, mm -hmm. SATs, well, are, yeah, SATs are at, at your cost. Um, and you guys actually sign up directly through the College Board website. Uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple process. If you just Google SAT registration or ACT registration, it's going to be the first link that pops up. But it, it'll walk you through this. pretty simple. Um, what kind of bump through some of these real quick. Well, um, it's, it's an easy process after you set everything up in your college board line. Yeah. But setting all that stuff up in your college board line, it, it takes about 40 minutes it's a, it's to get process. everything into college board, get your kid registered and understood that it's a person. Then it's registered for a test, boom, done. But the first bit, your, your college board entrance, where you start typing in your information, Allow about 40 minutes and just sit down and get it all done because it's really hard to go back and figure yeah. all that stuff out. So yeah, you got to once you get it all the, in, then it's it requires a photo upload. Um, you're filling out a profile <coughs> they, like a lot of times. Yeah, and the photo is simple. So. You just take it right there, and they, you know, when you get it all finished, you take your little iPad or whatever. But the nice thing is that account, if they already have a college board account, some, some students have already created done. it in the past. They can actually re-log in and use that same account. Um, and it's also the account that you'll use for your AP scores, ordering the test score. So once you do it, it's all in one simple location. Um, so some really quickly, um, some really quick facts about the new SAT and then some of the changes. Um, there are four parts to it. Uh, and there's they've made an optional essay component. My suggestion to people taking it uh, with this new redesign is always take the optional essay. I have no idea what colleges are, I don't think colleges know yet, what they're gonna do if you, how are you going to use the score if you don't have it? You know, if you don't take the essay, but the school that you're applying to requires the essay, will they consider it? There's a lot of questions about that. So I would suggest always taking the optional essay because if you don't need it, they'll throw it out. If they need it, great, you got it. Um, it's going back to a 1600 top score, so it's not a 2400 scale anymore. Um, so it's a little bit different scoring. <coughs> um, it's three hours without the essay, about three hours and 50 minutes with it. Uh, there's four answer choices, so there's not going to be A through E anymore, or F, it's A through D. Um, and they don't get a wrong an or a penalty for a wrong answer. Where in the past, they actually lost a quarter of a point for every wrong answer. They, they kind of justified that with their, their mitigating the guess probability. So are they saying, answer the question now? Don't, yep. don't, don't leave it blank for the zero? Yep. Don't leave it blank. Okay. So always answer this on the new test. If you take, a, if you take in October, you definitely want to do scientific guessing narrowed down because you do lose a point if you get it wrong, but nothing if you leave it blank. So, so it's, that's a big, big major change that we're big fans of. The 1600 score, that does not include the essay though because Correct. it's an 800 and 800. So how do they grade the essay? Just totally separately? And what's that scoring? So the essay will come out in a separate score. Um, 
kind of like the ACT essay is. So they'll, they'll come out with their overall subject scores, and then they will come out with their separate essay score in addition to that. Um, an essay, by definition, is subjective, right? So what do they do with an essay? So someone has to read it. Yep, give they, have, they have readers. And they subjectively give you a score. Yep. They're, they're very good. They're, they're the ones that do the AP, they do the AP exams. They're two readers. Yeah. For each one. So two people read it, they average the scores, like they come out. They, they, have, a pretty, they have a norm reference. I mean, there's test designers that design these things, so they, they, I, they know way more than I do. So um, I trust that they know what they're doing. Um, so the, another big change is kind of how people are going to prep, and I promise we're almost finished. Um, you don't have to necessarily go out and hire this big, fancy, expensive SAT prep service any longer. Um, you can still, if you'd like, um, but mainly, to be honest, what those guys would do in the past would teach you not how to, how to prepare for the test. They would teach you how to game the test and not be screwed over by the system. They would teach you how to, how to spend your time wisely, which is still important, which, you know, the time element doesn't go away. They're still going to have to answer a question every thir you know, 30 seconds or something like that. And to get through at a, and pace themselves. However, much of the time was spent on things like, okay, if you don't know the answer, how do you statistically get to a point where you can, you know, have more odds of getting it right than not? How do you answer this question that you don't know, you know, what they're trying to ask you? How do you find that part of the question? Another big change is they're doing away with things like, I believe the analogies are all gone. Some of the, the stupid, tricky stuff that they used to have in there that's just ridiculous that no one ever used, they've done away with. So that's a really good change. So some of the biggest areas that um, they're, this is directly from the College Board website. They're saying this is how you prepare, is paying attention in school. The information is going to come from classes. They, the redesigned content is aligned with primarily the Common Core and also aligned with what students at the individual grade levels in that junior, senior year, who are most of the students taking these tests, are actually learning in classrooms. So it gives value to teachers as well to kind of substantiate what they're learning and why you don't just want to learn for the test next week. You've got to remember it you know, in three months on your next SAT. Um, being inquisitive is also fairly important. You know, they're, they're kind of putting a little more creativeness and critical thinking into this exam. Um, so where it, it's becoming more of a, uh, an, an aptitude test instead of a scholastic test, I think is the right. Where they're studying not necessarily everything that you know, but like what you're capable of. Like, what you're capable of. I think that's the right, correct way to do it. Um, and then, oh, achievement test instead of, ap instead of aptitude test, backwards. Um, but yeah, it kind of compares the, the two different, they're, they're now becoming fairly similar. The ACT, just so you know, is not changing. That's staying the same. Um, but the ACT also, if your student had taken the plan in the past, which they discontinued, um, it did come with like an interest inventory, so that's also another benefit uh, to the SAT is it provides some additional career information that, uh, with that, those results. Um, <coughs> uh, SAT actually goes above the new one. I didn't update that line. Um, SAT actually goes above Algebra 2 now. It includes uh, advanced principles of mathematics and, and some pre-calculus information. Uh, just so you know, the, the content is changing and becoming a little more rigorous. Um, less tricky, more content rigor, you know, content rigor involved in um, what they're doing. Um, no science section on the SAT, like I said, both have optional essays. You want to check with the admissions sites of schools that you're considering to see if they require the optional essay and if they have certain set cut scores that they're looking for. Um, most schools have started putting up this information on whether they are requiring it now because people are asking. Um, but again, I do suggest always just taking the optional essay. It's an extra 50 minutes. I don't think it costs any extra money, and you'd rather have it than not have it. Um, so consider which one you're going to score better. Uh, if you do want to kind of have some prep, that's free. We have a couple different prep tools that you can use. One is that prep me tool through, through Naviance. Um, there's a video. I emailed it several times to your kids. They should know how to find it, but if they don't, they log in. It's the upper left-hand corner. It says prep me. It's a great tool. Um, right now, I think it's still in the old system, uh, but it will be updating uh, in the next couple months to the new redesigned format. Um, another great tool is Khan Academy. They actually are officially partnered with College Board on this, and they offer free SAT prep um, online through the Khan Academy with, I think, right now, eight full-length SATs that students can take on the new and the old system. Okay, so that's a great tool that students can access. Um, and if they have a Khan Academy account, it'll actually, just like with PrepMe, kind of track them through the process. 
So I'd encourage you guys to have them use both of those tools to kind of work on that prep uh, for these tests. These are tests that you cannot just waltz into and do well. Um, they're tests that take prep and effort um, and practice and, and like dedication within your classroom as well as some of this kind of review material. We are trying to get a half day seminar as well. Um, we weren't super happy with the last couple that we brought in, so we're looking at other options, and we haven't found a great one that's within our price range yet. Um, so that's to be determined, to be announced, but we're hoping to have one sometime this fall. Um, there will be limited seats if we can pull one off, um, and I don't know how many of those seats will be, so just check your emails, have your kids listen to announcements, because it'll probably come quick. And as seats fill up, typically we have a cap, and that's what we have to stick with. Um, We'll skip this. We kind of talked about most of this type of stuff. Um, we talked about most of that. And I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Um, again, most of the non stuff I'll work with your students on. Um, but does anybody have any questions before that anybody might want to answer? I'll hang around for a few minutes uh, afterwards. But what Dean was talking about setting up the college profile, you'll send out a guide sheet. It's an online thing, right? For the college board. Got a college board. There's not really a guide out there for it. It's literally it's, a, it's, it's like it's filling out a profile service. that you do. Um, yeah. It's pretty it's pretty intuitive. Okay, but I mean, so I thought it was not, it was a preamble to do the SAT. You don't have to have it set up. No, you do. You have to have your stuff. Not set for because the SAT. For right, the SAT test. For your SAT, you have to ship yeah. all that stuff to the colleges and such. So yeah. it all comes into one computer line, so that our Naviance right. can catch up with College Board. And they want to make sure that all the information well, do we, is. Do we get it right. to an No. No, go to, I just I went to SAT to sign up for that and Google they SAT gave registration. Me the whole and thing through that. Yeah, that, that, that was what I was asking. It'll be the first link. Got it. It's, it's like not long, complicated. It's yeah. just yeah. time consuming. Yeah, they do it too. Yeah, if yeah. you're doing the SAT, it's also or the sorry the ACT, it's also another website you're signing up for. So yeah. um, there's be a so like in the next two years, just an FYI, there's gonna be a lot of forms to fill out. So just <laughs> Don't get mad at me because I'm telling you to do it. Just, they're just a part of the process. <laughs> the ACT and the SAT are two separate. Yes. I mean, I mean, two well, I different separate, But it's an either and or, not a both. You I can mean, take both. You take both. You're gonna, I would, if you take both, you submit both scores. You submit both scores, and then you let the colleges decide what they want to do with it. You don't want to take a decision out of their hands. You want to say, hey, you know what? I think this score is better, but they might look at this and say, hey, I like that aspect of that score better. You. You want to give them as much information that they can make a decision about you from and let them do the decision, then you taking that opportunity out of their hands. And the ACT is the same, it's take it five or six times and they take No, the you're gonna you're gonna want to take so so my my suggestion yeah. is is take one of each to start, look at the scores and try to compare and see which one you might have done a little bit better on. If you did better on the ACT, start taking the ACT. And maybe drop stop doing the SAT. So they're equal though. I mean, they're, they're comparable, equal. yes. So so in terms of like colleges I don't know of a college out there that's only going to take one or the other. They're going to ha they have literally a cross score that they can say a 36 on this is equal to this, and so on and so forth for each score. Um, but it's really going to be more of a student um, aptitude of which one they're more inclined to be successful on that you might want to focus on. Th thus, having them take one and one start and see what the scores kind of align with. And I'm happy to help you guys decipher some of that stuff too. Um, it's not always cut and dry, but um, usually it's pretty easy to tell which one they probably will be su more successful on. Any other questions? You're not going to be doing this all by yourself. Our Pathways classes with our juniors, we are walking these things with our kids all the way through. And If your kids hated Pathways in 9th good. and 10th grade year, it gets a lot more interesting in 11th and 12th grade year. And, and they find, I think, a lot more value. We do a lot of really good stuff in 9th and 10th grade, but it's totally different flavor in 11th and 12th. Um, and they see, I think, a little more connection to what they're actually doing and what, what they're interested in. Um, at the 11th and 12th grade year, year primarily, so so they, it, we do a lot in 11th and 12th grade in Pathways. Mm -hmm. It's really quick, so they need to they need to be there. To make sure they're not missing Pathways. Like there's a lot of stuff they miss, they're going to be behind. Um, so just make sure that they're not like going to 7-Eleven at brunch and not coming back or something. Please. Let's just put those crackers on. Any other questions, or comments, or thoughts? I'm happy to stay around for just a minute uh, and answer questions as well. I do have to go pretty soon because my wife's waiting for dinner for me, but um, <laughs> I'll just make a meeting with you later. But yeah, if you guys have questions, email, definitely the easiest way, but we can sit down. If you want to sit down and do some time, like, looking specific to all the stuff, let's wait until maybe, like, November-ish, and then we can sit down and have some more dedicated time, but that way I don't take too much time to see you. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, anytime. Right, that was good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jeff. No problem. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thanks,
Um, 
So yeah, this year is going to be fairly important regarding uh, what's going to be coming up. And really, this is kind of the first year of what I would consider like your post-secondary plan. Um, ninth and tenth grade year really is kind of foundational to developing your high school self. And then eleventh and twelfth grade year um, is really foundational towards developing your college self. So it's really transitioning. We're, we've kind of made that jump into the post-secondary options um, already. So we'll talk a lot about what that looks like. Um, let's see if this will work. All right. So we don't need to go over what we're going to talk about. One reminder I want to start with um, is we do have that community service. So I just want to make sure that we're clear about the community service requirement. Um, and you guys are the first class, I believe, that will be going through that will have the full 30 hours required um, in the in the spring of 2017. Now, so so they'll be due at the end of May, and so all students will need a minimum of 30 hours recorded with me for graduation. But there is two requirements that we use. Um, so one is that 30 hour total requirement for, for community service, where a student will not graduate from North Tower High School without having 30 hours completed, documented um, by the time that May 2017 rolls around. However, a student could, or they might have already, your student may have already completed those 30 hours through different events and different things that they've maybe gone above and beyond what, what our yearly requirement is suggesting. So in that case, your student is good to go with that requirement. If your student already has 30 hours of community service, for example, um, recorded, then for this requirement, they are ready. They will graduate. And for students that are new, transferring into the school and that kind of thing, so we do prorate it, just so you know, um, we're not going to hold you, re you know, required to do those past hours that you're not here for. Um, but there's also a secondary requirement that we have in place, and that's tied to your Pathways class and the Pathways grade, which is not which is pass and no pass, um, and it's a one credit towards graduation electives. However, um, we do have a yearly requirement that students need to make. So. Essentially, this year, next year, going forward, you'll need to meet eight hours every year um, this year, next year, to meet that yearly requirement, or else you will not pass Pathways class. Um, so those are the two requirements that kind of keep students moving towards that goal. So if you've already got 30, you're good to go for that, but you still need to meet that eight-hour minimum uh, to pass that Pathways curriculum. Um, we are going to be a little more uh, strict. We've kind of slowly been increasing it as we get students used to it, but I think we're far enough along that we can say we're We'll be pretty um, on top of the pre-approval process and the parent signature piece of the community service. Um, not because we like paperwork and not because I like giving Dean paperwork to do, um, but because it's, it's mostly a safety issue. Um, we want to make sure that when your students are out doing community service, that they're doing something that you think is safe and you think that you're okay with do, them doing. So we don't, we don't want them standing on the side of the road picking up trash and getting hit by a car or get something thrown at them and being injured and you not knowing what they're doing. And then it's our fault because we told them they have to do community service. So that's, that's the parent side of things. The school side of things is we don't want your student have, you know, giving up their weekend or their Saturday afternoon and then not getting school credit for it. So kind of covering both sides. So that's why that parent signature and that pre-approval is important to us. Um, so please make sure that they're doing that. And we do have some pre-approved school-wide events that, uh, that we do uh, kind of blanket approve. For example, like the Sierra Century Ride and like the Ski Swap. Um, i trying to think of other ones that might come up. Um, certain other events that happen throughout the year that are, that are basically school functions that we are the ones putting on essentially the community service. We will pre-approve as a school that, from our side, we will let you guys do that for the hours. You just need the parent permission to be able to do it. Um, so you don't have to worry about meeting up with your pathways teacher for those to get those approved. Myself and Ms. Mitchell and Mr. Padilla can also sign off on those because I know that pathways only meets twice a week. Um, and so if it's a Friday and you need to have something ready for Saturday, come see us in the office and we can sign off on community service uh, before you guys get ready. Or even an email can, can suffice and we can just print out an email and say, yep, that's good to go. Or, no, that's not something we would count for community service. Any questions about community service? The biggies are, yeah. I'm sorry, I was late, but has something changed? Like, so do they have to get 30 hours in addition to the eight? No, so there's two requirements, oh, okay. um, just in review. So sorry, um, the two requirements are you need 30 hours total cumulative between all four years. Um, by the time they graduate in end of May in 2017, they need to have 30 hours documented, which would be the 6888. Um, total oh, for 30 hours. Eight, three years. But some students, some students meet the 30 hours, say, freshman year. 
And so that requirement's met. Mm -hmm. However, they still requ are required to do the yearly hour of you know, attainment each year. Right, you can't do it all in one year. Yeah, so, so that's the two requirements. Okay. Um, the biggies are basically it's got to be nonprofit, it's got to affect the community as a whole, and it's got to be safe. Um, so those are the big things that we will look for in terms of community service. So it can't be moving your uncle's garage to another storage facility for free. It can't be uh, passing out flyers for a business that's going out of business and trying to sell all their stuff. So it's got to be a nonprofit. It can't be trying to raise money. Um, so soup kitchens, dog shelters, like that kind of thing. Your standard community service volunteer activities. Um, the other thing that sometimes gets asked is the sports question. I just want to review the sports. Sometimes sports, sporting teams or bands go out and do activities that are what would be considered community service. And the big question to ask yourself there is, will you be punished if you don't go? Okay, so is there, will you run lines if you don't go to the car cleanup or, or the, the car wash? Will you have some sort of negative consequence from the team that everyone's required to go or else this will happen? If that's the case, it's not community service. It's a sporting event. Um, if there's no consequence, you can sleep in whenever you want and you don't have to go to this thing, totally you can count that as community service for like a, a sports team um, trash pickup day or something like that. Okay, any other questions about community service? I know it's kind of like, a, it's always kind of a, a little bit confusing topic because there's so many different things you can do with it. And if you guys can think of more later, you can ask me. And um, this, the packets are out. Um, so another thing I want to remind you guys about, we're kind of going to do some reminders before we jump into the meat of it. And I know people are going to show up. And I do apologize for you guys that came late, that I sent out the late notice tonight. Um, not, not intentional, I promise. Um, so this is a reminder that students are expected to study one to two hours every single night. Okay? As we get into 11th and 12th grade and we get into more AP coursework, get into more of this highly rigorous college prep course uh, material, it's going to be more probably towards the two hours a night for many of your students, um, if not more than that on occasion. And so, so that's just a really good thing. I'm, hopefully they've had some practice in the last year or two with the studying kind of one to two. Um, we're trying to do, you know, we kind of like relighten this up every fall and it kind of like tapers off a little bit. I'm hopefully going to keep it going more throughout the year um, and reminding students and asking students about what they're doing for their one to two. But really it's, a, it's a, something that you guys need to be doing at home. It's something that really comes from the parent side of things of, you know, you guys asking your kids, okay, you're home for practice. You say you did your homework at school and you finished everything. But what else do you have to do? You, you have one hour that you need to be reading, you need to be researching colleges, you need to be looking at how to write that college essay, you can, um, you know, you can uh, prep ahead for, a, for an upcoming quiz or a test. All those things are study. All those things are, are good activities that can fill this one to two hour expectation that we have here at school. Okay, we're not going to track you down if you don't have it done, but your grades and typically your success level at school will track you down for us. So, We'll, we'll, we'll get you sooner or later, um, whether you're on the DNF list sometimes or um, if you are uh, kind of just having me run, run into you in the hallway and asking you not having an answer. Um, the average high school student studies about 19 minutes a, a, a week, I believe. I think I actually, it's not 19 minutes a night, it's 19 minutes a week, which is pretty bad. Um, that's across the country, and that's probably a small sampling expanded to the, to the entire population, but it's pretty accurate, uh, especially when you start getting into to other areas of the country. Up here, I think it's a little better. Our students are pretty good students for the most part, um, but they still, that's the biggest impact that we see students having when they go to college, is the lack of understanding of what actual studying is and the prep work for college-level studying and college-level prep, because that's a big deal, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of dedicated effort and practice. It's kind of like working out. If you don't work out in high school, going to college is like going from you know, lifting 20s to lifting 80s. And, and you know, you're going to break something, you're going to feel bad, you're going to hurt yourself um, if you're not prepared for it. So that's, what we're, that's part of our goal here in the junior and senior year, is really prepping them to learn how to study. Um, and we kind of talked about the homework, uh, re going back and reviewing chapters that they're reading in class. Reading is actually one of those activities. So, so finding a pleasure book that your student likes to read. I'm not saying you have to read a textbook. Find something they're interested in and they can spend an hour reading. Just learning vocabulary will help them on things like SATs, on writing those essays. Uh, any questions about one to two and kind of the expectation of work? We'll kind of jump into probably a little bit new material. Um, I want to kind of go through a little bit of looking at a transcript. Some of you guys might not have seen many transcripts very frequently. 
Um, and this is one from, uh, I think I printed it about two years ago, so there's a few very minute details different with our current ones. Um, but I'll, I'll highlight what those are. When you're looking at a transcript, I also want to mention that there are two different transcripts you'll probably see. Okay, you'll probably have, you might have been on Aries through your parent portal and seen the transcript that you can, can look at from your computer. Okay, that is your transcript. However, it's going to look very different from the one we print at school and the ones that get sent to colleges slash jobs, employers, uh, once you graduate and as you're going through school. What we see on the screen right now is kind of a smaller version of what a typical, I think that's going to be like a halfway through, starting their 11th grade year, um, transcript that we would print out uh, and possibly send to colleges or what I review when I get a new student or are looking at classes and credits. Okay, so it looks a little bit different, has the exact, exact same information though. On the one on Aries, you can still access things like the GPA, their class rank, all of their credit information. Um, it just is in a little bit different display format, just so you know, so don't freak out, because I had a couple questions about the, this morning about, well, mine doesn't look like that. It's okay. Um, we can print these for you, because sometimes I like to use this because it's a little bit easier to digest. Um, but yeah, there's also something called the graduation status report on the areas that's also pretty useful if you want to look at credits that are still required for graduation. Um, and keep in mind, this is all high school graduation only. This does not include any college level credits. So like when, it's saying, when, when we talk about credits required and needed, um, that's strictly for high school graduation. The college credits are much more they're in addition to these credits. Um, if you're not going to, will you explain weighted GPA yep. and... That's what I was going to do right now. Okay. Um, so GPA is also something that's fairly confusing to people and sometimes a new idea. Typically when you're kind of ninth, 10th grade, most students aren't really going to necessarily be concerned about their GPA. When you start looking at, you kind of start transitioning to this upperclassman, <coughs> this um, kind of college search process, that's when GPA and class rank really becomes kind of the utmost importance to many students and many parents at times. Um, and it is important. I don't want to downplay the importance of GPA and class rank. Okay? <laughs> However, it's not everything that people make it out to be. Um, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But I want to explain first what GPA is and how we get it and, and really why we use it. Um, so when we're looking at transcript, this top yellow bubble here, and I've got to wait my way through these guys. Uh, this top yellow bubble, when you're looking at a transcript, also at the bottom of that Aries portal will have the different GPA types. We have three main types, but really it's six, because we have a weighted and a non-weighted GPA format. And what weighting is, is when a student takes an AP level course, so an advanced placement course, or a Sierra College or other collegiate level course and reports it to the high school, they receive what's called a weighted GPA credit for that class. And what that is is basically a good job, you're, you're really challenging yourself reward for taking that challenge on and being successful. So when you're calculating a GPA, it's a mathematical formula. If you look up there, you can kind of see all the different classes. For example, um, you might not be able to read it from here, but I can. Um, in that top kind of semester in the top left, it's got four classes. And it's got four grades, an A, a B, and two A's. Okay, so three A's two, and one B. And what happens when you're calculating GPA is each of those grades is allocated a grade point. Okay, so an A equals 4, a B equals 3, a C equals 2, and a D equals 1, and an F equals nothing. And so each of those grades is allocated those points. So for example, that would be what, 3 times 4, 12, and 3 is 15 points for that first semester. You then divide that by the total number of courses that you then took, and that creates your GPA, your grade point average. So, you know, 15 divided by 4 is 3.75. Um, so that's going to be their GPA, and that's how you calculate it. Um, now that, that weighted GPA that we reward students that take those AP coursework with, um, basically what that does for those individual classes, it bumps that grade point that you get for that class up one. One so, or a half. I mean, one, one's pretty one. significant. One. So, so, for example, an A... Uh, an A in a non-weighted class, a standard math class, a standard English class, is equal to four points. An A in a college level or AP course is equal to five points. And that's really how people are going to get those 4.2, 4.3, 4. above a 4.0 GPA. Uh, otherwise, if you got straight A's, you'd get the highest you could get is a 4.0. Um, so that's going to be the difference between a weighted and a non-weighted GPA. All right. Um, 
<coughs> now when you're looking on the left hand side, you th that's kind of like the columns when you look at that GPA. That's the weighted and non-weighted. When you're looking at the rows, there are three rows. The top row on the top uh, is going to be your academic 9 through 12 GPA. Okay, and academic is anything, when you're looking at this, I, I can't remember if on the ARIES portal that you guys can see if it has the little denotions about whether it's a college prep class or whether it's academic or not. Um, I can't remember. I feel like it's probably not, um, but it is on these transcripts. And you can find out what that little course tag is right above all this. Um, you can't read it from there probably, but um, when you're looking at it, it denotes non-academic courses with a little asterisk or star. And non-academic courses are strictly going to be your PE classes. Um, it's going to be, up until this year, it's going to be your engineering, tech, and culinary courses. <coughs> it's going to be, uh, Pathways is not included in GP automatically because it's a pass-fail class, or pass-no-pass no class. So it's a non-GPA weighted course, um, non-GPA accounted course. Um, and I think that's it uh, for, the, for what most students are going to take. Um, Okay, so the academic, there's like three, and I noticed they're all, I mean... In yeah, so the, so the academic is going to include all of the, essentially your core courses. It's going to throw out uh, their CTE classes through this year. This year, uh, the engineering tech classes are now A through G slash academic approved. Um, so that should be changing for this year going forward. But in the past years, um, those were considered non-academic courses, even though they're very valuable courses. Um, they wouldn't be calculated in this GPA. Um, PE as well gets thrown out. So sometimes it helps. Your GPA looks better and sometimes on that one. Sometimes it hurts your GPA, depending on kind of your other grades and if you have AP course at this point or not. Um, the second one down says academic GPA, and then in the parentheses it says 10 through 12. Okay, This one's in there to help you guys when you're looking at the CSU and UC system. Because the CSU and UC system, when they're looking at calculating GPAs, it basically throws out your ninth grade year. <coughs> And they don't consider your 12th grade year. Because when you apply as a senior next year, they won't have any grades by the time you hit that submit button. And really, almost before they even make decisions. Um, so, so they're making a decision based on your entrance on that 10 through 12 GPA. So really, it's four semesters. Um, which also can help or hurt, depending on how your 9th grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade goes. If you had a great 10th and 11th grade, not so hot 9th grade, that could help you in the long run. Um, if you had maybe a more, you know, a much stronger beginning and you kind of slacked off in your 11th grade year, that can hurt you when you start looking at this kind of grade point average. Um, however, that grade point average of the UCs and CSUs uh, to, to consider eligibility does not, I mean, still needs to include the 9th grade for eligibility purposes. So you still have to pass 9th grade English with this C or better. You still have to meet those minimum eligibility requirements. Um, this is strictly for the GPA. They still look at ninth grade for all of that. Um, and you do report the classes that you'll take as a senior. You just won't report grades until the very end after they've made a decision about you, and hopefully you kept up with your side of the bargain. Because they do rescind admissions if you don't. Um, you'd have to kind of really probably screw it up pretty big, but um, it happens every year. People get, you know, they go in with a, you know, they apply with a 4.0 and they get, you know, straight C's in their senior year. Like, we don't want someone who's just going to give up and get senioritis. So, so that's pretty important. The bottom one is strictly a straight GPA. Okay, that's going to be a com it's calculating every single class that's not a non-pass-fail class. Okay, so that's what that bottom one is. It's everything including PE, including um, engineering, everything that you took. <coughs> okay, so those are the three different ones, and then the weighting is the other two, so they'll have the weighted and non-weighted options. <laughs> Typically, when, we're when you're looking at applications, except for the CSU and UCs, I'm going to use your weighted academic 9 through 12 GPA typically when I report it. However, some colleges want specifics, and they'll ask me for it. Um, but unless otherwise specified, that's usually the one that I'll report. So that's what you're, when you're looking at that, that's what to think about as your GPA in most likelihood. Um, class ranks down there as well, with the as well as the class size. Um, Class, class rank, we do an exact class ranking system, meaning there can be ties. Okay, so if your students like rank number 10, and you're like, they kind of compare sometimes. You're like, man, my GPA's not that low. I know what other kids get. I, I've seen kind of their grades or whatever, and their GPA in the past. Well, how am I so low? And what, what happens is many times there will be a tie, and in that circumstance, what happens is maybe there's, um, you have a student who's number one, you have a student who's number two, and then you got 
three students tied for number three. So you got one, two, three, three, three. The next person's going to be a six. Okay, so there's not actually a four and five. They're all threes, technically. The next person's going to be a six. So that's how people can quickly get bumped down is when there's a bunch of ties happening. When you start getting into your senior year, though, things start spreading out much more. Um, right now, most people have taken about the same level of courses, and if students are getting relatively good grades, they're all going to be kind of neck and neck with each other in terms of GPA. Once students start taking college courses, once students start, start taking more AP coursework, that's when the GPAs start kind of fluctuating, and you get these little kind of separations, and this, the class rank ends up, usually, we don't see many ties. Um, so that's kind of both of those systems. And let me talk a little bit about why we use them and why they're important, but why they're also not, you know, super detrimental to your life if it's not exactly what you want it to be um, or what your student wants it to be. Um, so basically, co when colleges in particular, and we're, we're primarily talking four-year colleges right now, um, two-year colleges do consider these things, but primarily for things like certain scholarships that they might have at their, at their community college, um, and that kind of thing. When there's no, really no uh, admissions kind of process for the two-year college. It's an enrollment process. They don't deny anybody at the two-year college based on your GPA. Um, as long as you've graduated high school and typically are above 18. However, at the four-year colleges, they use the GPA class rank really as a comparison tool, not with other kids around the country, but really more so with kids in our campus. So, that, so the GPA is, is, you can't compare our GPA necessarily with someone from Florida or New York. Um, there are, you know, or someone for, with us, our school is 370 students, someone with 3,700 students, for example. It's pretty, it's like apples to oranges many times. So what they use GPA for is to kind of compare what other students are doing at our school with what's available to them. So, you know, are students taking the number of AP course, courses that they need to be successful, and are they really challenging themselves with, with what's offered to them? Or are they kind of just taking one or two and skating by with the easy path? Um, when you start talking about comparison, and we'll talk, we will talk about tests, I promise, because it's going to be, a, it's, a, it's kind of an important year for, for testing this year. Um, but that's really what s schools use to really compare other people. Because when students are taking the SAT, which is uh, one of the more popular ones out here, uh, college entrance exam, or the ACT, which is the other one, um, those are national standard and normed based exams that students across the country take that a student from California compared against a student from New York can be pretty equally matched together and compared. That's the big reason why there's so much emphasis on these tests is because they are the really only norm reference tool to compare one student to another. Um, you know, all the other areas other than kind of like essays and we start looking at essays and um, maybe extracurriculars it's pretty hard to compare anything else based on what's available to them. So that's the, the importance of the testing, and we will talk about some specifics there. Um, at the bottom, and I probably need to, uh, need to update this going forward, it'll say the CASI, the California High School Exit Exam. Right now the word is that's not going to really impact your kids, um, so that's, that's what we're using going forward. Um, I don't think we're even going to be offering it in the future uh, for the kids that haven't passed this year. Um, I would need to double check with Alejo probably, but um, that's, I think, the latest word that I have. Um, so that will actually probably be going off of our transcripts fairly soon, probably in the next year. And, uh, but most students here have probably passed that exam. It's, it's a fairly standard test. Um, there's only a handful of students that typically struggle, and we know who they are, and then we're working with them on it. Uh, but it is on the transcript for right now. And then finally, on the right-hand side, um, you'll see the credit summary. That's also a fairly important thing for people because that tells you how many classes you have left to take for grad, high school graduation. Okay. Um, right now at North High School we have 220 total credits required. You get 10 credits a year, so 5 credits per semester with a past class. And we do count D's and above as passing, just so you know, in case you were had forgotten that. Um, but there's three different columns and then the subjects all go down the rows. All right. And so for example you see the English 9. The student obviously is in 11th grade, so they should have passed that English 9, which they did. So they'll say credits required 10. Next to that, they'll say completed 10 credits for any class that's complete. If that class wasn't completed, for example, in English 11, the third call, the third one down, it'll have 10 credits in the needed category. So that's kind of how you read that. And you can do see that as well on that graduation status report through Aries to see what they're doing. All 11th graders got a copy of their transcripts 
in the first two weeks of school and they all went through them and kind of went through their own credit check as well. I also check credits and I also check uh, students where they're at and so far everyone's good. Okay, so there's multiple checks involved to make sure students are taking the courses that they need. Um, and it's good because occasionally, you know, a student will sign up for a class and I go through all their